Hello. My name is Kelly Tebow, and I'm in with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our fifth in a series of webinars. We are pleased to have you join us. When you exit the webinar, there will be a brief evaluation that we would like you all to fill out. All participants are muted, so in the course of the webinar, if you have a question, there is a place on your screen panel to type any question you may think of during the presentation. We will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. There is also a chat board available on the NJCTS website to post additional questions that may come to mind after the webinar. This webinar, this board will be monitored for the next seven days, and your questions will be answered by our presenters. If you missed any part of this presentation or would just like to hear it again, an archived version will be made available on the website as well. In the event that the audio portion of the webinar fails, all attendees, please hang up and call the number you dialed at the beginning. The number should be 1-877-241-4280. Access code 297-96149. In the event that the video portion of the webinar fails and you get the exit survey early, our presenters will immediately move to the question and answer portion of the webinar. When the video is restored, we will pick up where we left off. Now I am going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thank you, Kelly. I want to welcome you all to the presentation portion of tonight's webinar. What you will see and hear tonight is Module 2 of our In-Service for Educators. Last week, we presented Module 1, which will be archived on our website very shortly, where it can then be accessed at your convenience. This is the in educator in-service that we offer to schools around the state so that educators can understand how TS and associated disorders can impact a student's success in the classroom. The webinar tonight will be presented by Janine Howley and Cheryl Ludwig. Janine has been a professional educator for over two decades. Her undergraduate and master's degrees are in special education. She has conducted workshops on Tourette syndrome and associated disorders for professionals in many New Jersey school districts, as well as colleges and universities. Janine is presently a teacher of, a, of middle school students in Ocean County, where she was recently selected Teacher of the Year. Janine is also an, a parent of an adult child with TS. Our other presenter, Cheryl Ludwig, is a nationally certified and licensed speech language pathologist with 35 years experience working with children in public schools, private practice, and, and as an adjunct professor at the College of New Jersey. On behalf of NJCTS, she presents in-service training to educators in schools and colleges across the state. Cheryl currently works as a speech pathologist in a county special services school district. She and her husband are the parents of three children, all diagnosed with TS and associated disorders. I would also like to welcome Sandy Romano, who will participate in the Q&A portion of tonight's webinar to assist with with educational questions. Sandy was an educator for over 30 years, having been a special education teacher, learning disabilities teacher consultant, and child study supervisor. She received her master's in educational specialist degrees from the College of New Jersey. She currently teaches at Rider University and consults for NJCTS. That concludes our introductions. I'm now going to turn the next portion of the program over to Janine and Cheryl to begin the presentation. Thanks. Good evening. I'd like to, well, to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Cheryl and I, as educators, are excited to bring you the second in a two-part series designed to bring you information about TS and associated disorders in the educational setting. In this module, we'll identify challenges of working with students with TS and associated disorders and specific strategies for building supportive relationships with, within the educational environment strategies that will help educators and students communicate better 
and strategies that will help educators and parents communicate better. We'll discuss specific techniques for dealing with symptoms of TS and associated disorders, some of which can be included in an IEP or 504 plan. Let's begin with a brief overview of what TS is. It's a neurobiological disorder characterized by tics. Tics are involuntary, rapid, sudden movements that occur repeatedly. The tics may occur many times a day, nearly every day, or intermittently. Tics periodically change in number and frequency, type and location, and they wax and wane in their severity. While some people with TS have limited control of their symptoms anywhere from seconds to hours at a time, suppressing tics may merely postpone a more severe outburst. Tics increase as a result of stress, anxiety, excitement, and fatigue. They often decrease with relaxation or concentration on absorbing tasks. Having reviewed that, let's get specific about ticks. Imagine having an eye-rolling tick, which may not even be apparent to the onlooker. As a classroom teacher, I may observe a child who constantly seems to be a very slow reader, but if, the, if that child is a TS child and has an eye-rolling tick, I may not even be aware that the child is having the eye-rolling tick, and that's what's causing the slowness on the reading because they're not able to keep their place. They keep losing their place in the line of writing. Or think about, excuse me, or think about having a head shaking tick. Again, if you're trying to track on a line of writing and you have a head shaking tick, you can imagine that you would frequently lose your place and that would slow your reading also. Vocal ticks can be very disruptive in the classroom and can create social stresses for a student. This might see where relaxation te techniques can help out. Cheryl? I have a feeling that Cheryl has dropped off the call, if you can continue on. Okay. okay. Cheryl will be with us shortly, and, and she has many more suggestions uh, specific to that. Um, we'll start all, uh, I'd like to move into uh, reviewing about OCD. Um, As we explained uh, last week in the first module of the webinar, around 60% of people with OCD, 60% uh, of people with TS also have OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. To review, obsessions are repetitive, unwanted thoughts. Compulsions are the repetitive ritualistic acts that must be performed to rid oneself of the obsession. When we give an on-site workshop, we brainstorm with the attendees about how OCD might interfere with performance. Imagine having, a, having an obsession with erasing words until they look perfect. That would certainly slow down writing. It may require an educator to bargain with the student to limit the number of erasures the student does. Might have to whittle them down. Say, today, I understand that, that you really have the urge to have perfect handwriting, but it's slowing you down, and I want you to get your work done. So today, let's say that you have 15 chips. Every time you do an eraser, we'll take a chip. Um, and then maybe a week later, you can whittle them down to 12, and then maybe 7, and then 5, and so on. And you want to get them down to as few erasures as possible so that they can get their work done more quickly. Some students with OCD might have an issue with germs, which causes obsessive hand washing. Hand wipes or hand sanitizer might come in handy here. Imagine having the urge to count every word in each line of writing. How well would you be able to concentrate? Books on tape can be handy for this issue, that you, the, the student doesn't have to count all the lines or count all the words in a line. Let's talk about, uh, let's move into challenges uh, um, of working with a student with attention deficit disorder. Keep in mind that around 70% of students with TS will also have ADD. To review, ADD, or attention deficit disorder, is characterized by difficulty staying on task, trouble with fidgeting, tough time waiting his or her turn, and a hard time organizing and remembering to bring the right material. ADD students are often overstimulated in chaotic environments like the cafeteria or hallways. Therefore, to be specific, this might be a good place to have extra trained staff members available. 
Remember that short-term memory difficulties are characteristic of ADD, so extra patient reminders are required. Assignment pads are also very helpful. Another issue that we often have with ADD students are rage issues, and we'll get into more specifics in a little bit. Janine? Yes? OK. It's Cheryl. OK. Um, Cheryl, let's back up if we could, please. Uh, you had some comments for us specifically on ticks that we wanted to go back and right. talk about. I apologize. There were some technical difficulties here. That's OK. Um, I'd also like to welcome everyone this evening. It's very exciting that you've chosen to spend your evening with us. Whether you're a parent or an educator, this is proof of your commitment to making the time children spend in school both productive and enjoyable. The ideas you hear tonight are not only good for children with PS and associated disorders, but they're sound educational practices that are good for all children. Before we really talk about tick behavior specifically, I think it's important to discuss the school and the classroom environment so that we set these children up for the best day. There are practical strategies <clears throat> and then invisible ones. The invisible qualities are shown to students by adults and will preserve a child's self-esteem and recognize special talents. A child dealing with a complex diagnosis can often have the view that the world is out there to beat them up. Creative teachers with compassion and understanding stand ready to deal with the challenges that this child definitely brings to a classroom. Educators, you need to tap every resource within your school building. This includes special subject teachers, speech and OT staff, the nurse, child study team staff, and even the custodian and bus driver and the lunch lady. Every person is going to have a different view of this child and then insight on how to make the day go smoother. Most importantly, we mustn't forget the parents. This isn't just a child issue, it's a family issue. And you must be prepared to open wide the line of communication between you and the parents. An open and frank dialogue between you will only contribute to a child's success in the classroom. Parents and educators, you're part of a team, and you're not in this alone. Children with TS seem to do best in classrooms with moderate structure and flexible teachers. Environments that are organized and not overly stimulating or distracting will help the children learn organizational strategies that are so frequently compromised by executive function disorders. These skills begin to shape at about the third or fourth grade. Routines, structure, and consistent classroom and home rules with clear expectations insert predictability into the school day and will therefore decrease stress and anxiety. Strategies might sound like some of these. Using checklists, materials that are color-coded by subject, red for reading, green for science, including a notebook folder and book cover, a buddy system to encourage peer support, a duplicate set of textbooks at home for the night that the backpack comes home empty, and also for previewing activities by the parent. Adjustments to teaching strategies can also include setting a time aside before each lesson for the children to become organized with materials. This just doesn't automatically happen. Explaining goals and requirements of the lesson before you begin. In high school and college, they call this a syllabus. Supporting auditory information with visual cues, especially if central auditory processing difficulties are present, and there are many times that they are in this population. Written handouts for larger assignments are essential. Cueing strategies to make sure that you have the children's attention using a consistent phrase or sound or gesture. If you remember the movie Kindergarten Cop, Schwarzenegger had a whistle. This is especially helpful just prior to transitions and activities. Lots and lots of positive feedback about what is going right. Our goal is always to focus on the positive, highlight the child's strengths, and create a learning situation that you know will be successful for the child, encouraging the special talents that these kids often demonstrate. At the end of the school day, do you have a child who wants to come back the next morning. And now to discuss tick behavior. Since we know that these are involuntary and rarely within a child's ability to control, the accommodations fall to the teacher to implement. These include frequent breaks out of the classroom to release ticks. It could be going to the bathroom, the water fountain, the nurse, or the child study team, or running an errand. High school students may seek out a special subject teacher or guidance counselor. 
children typically do not take advantage of this privilege and they will use it as needed. It needs to be a free access path. Scheduling core academics early in the day is a helpful strategy. Ticks tend to increase with fatigue. Why not consider scheduling a break time just after lunch or a cluster of difficult subjects? Block scheduling with longer class times often necessitates this. Could the child go shoot hoops for five minutes, play the drums in the music room, or draw or work with clay in the art room at the midday point? This allows for a scheduled release time and sets the child up for success for the second half of the school day. Providing a safe haven where the child can go if ticks become severe is essential. The nurse or the psychologist office or the resource room are good places to consider. If time out of class is extended, schoolwork can be sent with the child. Test modifications, including extended time and separate location, are to be considered as well. Stress aggravates ticks, and tests, for most of us, are always stressful. Tapping ticks, why not give the child a sponge or a mouse pad on the desk to tap on? Foot tapping ticks, how about a carpet mat under the desk, or stocking feet are quiet when they tap? There must be a fluid seat assignment. If ticks are especially severe, the child should have the liberty to move the desk to an area where they feel they'll create fewer distractions and experience less staring from their peers. Teachers, it's up to you to set the tone for acceptance and tolerance. Remember that the ticks will wax and wane. Janine? Now, as we discussed before, we talked briefly for a little bit about the fact that several people with TS also have OCD. And we started to talk specifically about some things that we could do for OCD. So Cheryl, let me turn it back over to you because you had some additional wonderful suggestions for educators as well as parents. Great. Creating an environment that reduces stress has to be right at the top of the list. Anxiety is the product of stress and with it an increase in OCD and ticks. School has to be viewed as an okay place to practice and to make mistakes. Let the children see you as a teacher make mistakes, then acknowledge them, Make a plan to revise and try it again. No punishment or ridicule for errors. Provide adequate time between transitions. This is especially important at the middle school setting where classes change. Allow the student to leave the class several minutes before the others to move through the transition in a much calmer environment. It also helps with organizational skills at a locker. Modifying the length and number of homework assignments is something you should consider. These kids are spent at the end of the school day and lengthy assignments will increase the frustration when compulsions get in the way. The quality of the work product suffers, and the child ends up angry and crying. Use your homework to test the mastery of a skill and not as busy work. Need a really sharp pencil point? Need to grind six pencils to the eraser every day. Teachers will say that's too much time wasted at the sharpener, and it is. Mechanical pencils are the easy solution with a limited supply of lead for the day Erasable pens can also be used. For those children with counting obsessions, Janine had mentioned books on tape. Um, if this dis uh, obsession continues out into other environments, sometimes distraction will help when moving through these other situations. For example, if a child is walking in the hallway and insists on counting steps, why not let them listen to music or sing along to music while they walk? MP3 players can also help to diminish some bus anxiety by, by creating a distraction. They may continue to sing the same song as they walk, but the singing is far more socially appropriate than the counting. After all, the military marches to a cadence. Symmetry obsessions to make things look right are best managed by allowing a child to use a computer for printed work and no more erasing a letter 15 times to make the perfect O. Graph paper, for math work so that all numbers line up the way they should can also be used. Janine, ADHD? Yeah, as we said, about 70% of the students uh, with TS also have ADHD. When we do our on-site workshops, again, we, we brainstorm about how ADD might interfere with uh, the educational environment. We said that uh, ADD characteristics are often seen in the classroom, either with or without TS. Um, let's talk specifically about some things that we can do to help students with ADD issues. Specifically, let's talk about the rage issue. Cheryl? Okay. Um, 
we're going to talk both about the ADHD and some of the uh, rage issues. Um, the term preferential seating has a whole new meaning for this child. There should be easy access to the teacher and yet the freedom for some movement within a space. If the child has ticks as well, front and center puts them in an embarrassing spotlight. A quiet place in the classroom for independent work is helpful and soundproof headphones might help to minimize auditory distractibility. Changing activities frequently with some advance notice about the transition, like in two minutes we'll be moving to the math lesson, um, it teaches a child how to end one task and then begin another. Breaking assignments down into manageable parts, uh, particularly for high schoolers giving advance notice of large and long range projects, will teach children how to prioritize the work that needs to be done. Modifying a visual field is both a strategy for kids with ADHD and those in this population that have learning difficulties. Um, if an entire page of math problems is too much to deal with, fold the paper in half or put bold boxes around the material that you want the child to focus on. Um, praising the accuracy of the work and not the speed, keeping a target goal in mind and keeping it positive, um, uh, teaching a class uh, the task of closure. Uh, for kids that have Tourette's and OCD and ADHD, there can be huge chunks of information that they miss throughout the day due to these interfering behaviors. Uh, I can liken it to having static on my phone line and only hearing every third syllable of a word. And then there's just a lot of information your brain needs to fill in. And lastly, I would strongly urge to get these kids outside for some recess time and large muscle activity that definitely supports improved attending skills. Um, I would also refer, refer you to some of the work by Mel Levine. Um, there are some books that um, will be posted, I believe, at the end of this webinar um, that you can access through your local bookstore. But he's written some very nice um, strategies on attending skills and breaking them down, which then lets us identify exactly where the child is having difficulty so we can develop target strategies to help. For kids with TSOCD and ADHD, many of them demonstrate mood disorders, which range, range from a short fuse and oppositional behavior to a full-blown rage attack. These are most often found in children with these complex triad diagnoses. Some accommodations for the child with a short fuse can include ongoing communication with the parents to stay informed about behavior patterns at home, sleep issues, medication changes, and medical status. Um, if these children are not feeling well, uh, it's only going to compound uh, the, the symptoms that you see in a classroom. Remember, 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 the behaviors are a part of the disability. And that, that may also be the expression of other learning problems. L allowing the child to leave the classroom before others to avoid crowds in the hallway during transitions will also minimize some of the uh, potential negative interactions with other students. Working with counselors and social workers to identify frustrations and triggers, and then helping the kids to develop strategies to cope is a much better alternative to punishment. Um, modification of large group activities, uh, for example, requirements or required attendance at assemblies or um, having lunch in the main cafeteria versus a smaller lunchroom. Um, and those are things that many times are within uh, a school building uh, ability to, to modify and alter. Remaining calm and speaking in a very non-emotional voice helps to give the child a safe place to regain control. Uh, it's important to remember not to discipline the child in the middle of a meltdown. It's not going to push the um, process any faster or in a much more positive direction. And then we always need to recognize and reward positive strides in the child's behavior. The following information is from a 2003 publication on TS and rage, and that is from our national office. And this differs a little bit, well, it differs a lot, actually, from the kids that just have the short fuse um, oppositional kind of behavior. And kids with rage attacks will demonstrate distinct episodes of intense anger that's unwanted, uncontrollable, and distressing. They're not typical of the child's usual behavior and personality, and he's unable to resist or control the anger, and the degree of it is grossly out of proportion to the trigger. The onset is sudden, it's unpredictable, and it's very, very explosive. 
The kids following the episode are humiliated and sad and remorseful. Their self-esteem and confidence to cope in a social situation will drop. And um, we can liken some of this to a temper tantrum in a young toddler, but then it persists into childhood and adolescence where it's no longer developmentally appropriate. Individuals with Tourette's and symptoms of OCD, ADHD, and mood disorders are at the greatest risk for these explosive anger outbursts. Neurochemistry appears to play the role in the expression of aggression, and the child as well as the family feels tense, uncertain, and stressed. In terms of intervention with kids with RAIDs, there really isn't much that can be done to stop this particular kind of outburst. Episodes have to run their course, and keeping the child in a safe, private place for this to happen preserves some self-esteem. Following the child, trying to talk things through, only pours fuel on the fire. The best intervention that we recommend to families is to um, continue to seek out medical professionals. As um, this study suggested, medication seems to be the best treatment at this time. Janine? Thanks, Cheryl. Now, I'm sure those of you who are listening are feeling like you're standing in front of a fire hydrant coming at you with information. But keep in mind that you can re-view um, this webinar uh, through the archived version. Um, additionally, at the end, Kelly will give you some information about ways that you can access publications that will also give you these suggestions. Now, because a number of students who also have uh, who have TS also have learning disabilities, in fact, about 25%. Let's take some time to talk about how fine motor and visual motor deficits might cause problems. If you saw this handwriting uh, from a second grader, you might not be su too surprised. But if you saw this paper coming from a high schooler, you might be shocked, or maybe not. Your initial assessment might be that the child is lazy or has an attitude problem. Please understand that the student isn't choosing to have a learning disability. It's the way he or she is wired. I'd, I'd like to try to explain it like this. You wouldn't expect perfect handwriting if the student had cerebral palsy or Parkinson's disease. It's important to emphasize here that uh, struggles with handwriting are often seen in students with TS and associated disorders. I have an Alpha Smart, which looks like a computer keyboard, but it has a screen at the top. And I keep that on hand in my classroom to allow students to type their work. I also encourage students to utilize uh, a word processor. Cheryl? All right. Tourette's and OCD and ADHD create the situation that alters the child's availability for learning. And I think that that's the key factor to keep in mind as we move through a school day, that if these things are interfering and they're consuming time and consuming energy from the child, that they're not available to attend to the lesson and to be there for the learning and the instructional part. Um, kids want to do well in school. And when things interfere with that, the anxiety increases. And unfortunately, it becomes a vicious cycle because with an increase in anxiety, we often see an increase in tics and OCD. So using some of the strategies to help minimize that will help these kids get through a school day. Um, we've talked extensively about books on tape and other supports that you can get through um, county library services. Um, minimizing the amount of copying from the board is a helpful strategy. If you can Xerox copies of notes or there's a special paper, if you've got uh, note-taking buddies paired that one person is writing a very complete set of notes, that's not to dismiss the high schooler with issues from attempting to take notes but then they can also rely on um, notes from a note buddy and uh, have a more complete set of information from which to do their studying. Um, for sensory issues, perhaps a special chair or chair pad. Um, sometimes I have uh, seen classrooms where there's a stretch band, um, those exercise stretch bands, and we can put those across the front of the desk, um, across the front legs of the desk, and the child can have some uh, sensory um, input by, by pressing and, and using that exercise band. Um, I would strongly suggest a consult with an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, um, as well as your child study team to uh, develop strategies that are specific to that child's needs. Again, using the computer, um, computer software, and a calculator with no penalty is a very helpful thing to get kids through the school day. 
uh, photocopying notes or the chapter from a book, and then teaching them how to use highlighters to pick out the, the important facts in the material, or use highlighter tape. Um, that's a, it looks like scotch tape, and you can place it over text, and then lift it and move it to another uh, paragraph or another page. And it, it stays sticky for a long time, and it comes in different colors. It's kind of a neat thing to use. I'm um, using index cards to help visually track and to limit the visual field. Um, are some other things. Um, in terms of taking tests, if this child is allowed to write directly on the test booklet, it's really difficult for schools, particularly at the college level, where they have to um, transfer answers from either uh, a computer screen or a test booklet to like a Scantron sheet. So if you can allow the child to write directly onto the test booklet, that will take that uh, factor out of, the, out of the mix and sometimes makes it easier. Can you? I want to talk uh, a little bit about peer training. Let me back up to the slide where we saw the handwriting. What do you think the reactions of an uninformed peer would be if a student with TS had really, really poor handwriting? Or a really rough time remembering directions of a task? Or displayed obvious vocal or motor tics? If peers don't understand what's going on, why a person makes the movements that he or she makes, it can lead to hurtful teasing. Therefore, peer training is extremely important. There are many different ways of peer training. Specifically, there are videos and DVDs available, like the HBO movie, I Have Tourette's But Tourette's Doesn't Have Me. If you want, you can even contact NJCTS so that they can give you additional resources. Now, we've covered, we've covered a number of strategies while we've talked about tics, obsessive compulsive disorder, attention deficit disorder, and learning disabilities. Here are some other helpful strategies uh, on, on the slides that you're seeing now. Uh, set up a signal for a student to be able to leave the classroom to relieve ticks. As Cheryl mentioned, untimed tests. Taking tests out of the regular classroom. Let students leave the class early to be in the hallway before everyone else. Or what I prefer is keep the student for the extra couple of uh, seconds, maybe even a minute if they have two minutes to change class, and then once the the majority of students have cleared out of the hall, then release that student, and they're not in that chaotic environment. For machine-graded tests, suggest that a student use a ruler or a straight edge, or as Cheryl said, an index card to keep everything lined up. As Cheryl said, um, students with TS or associated disorders should be referred for testing. During our question and answer portion, we'll have additional help this evening from Sandra Romano regarding referral and testing, as well as IEP and 504 issues. Cheryl? I hope that you found the suggestions helpful this evening. It would be nice to just email everybody one sheet of strategies and accommodations to deal with school challenges, but this would never work. The needs and the learning styles and the complexities of overlapping issues are as unique as each child's physical appearance. These children personify the adage, think outside the box. Strategies must be customized to each child and remain fluid. What you see today and how you accommodate it can change like the wind. As educators, flexibility and creativity will be your two best resources for supporting children with TS and associated disorders. I often tell colleagues and graduate students that there is a reason for 26 letters in the alphabet, and that is so that you can have a plan Z. Janine? I want to encourage everyone to brainstorm with other colleagues and parents as well, because oftentimes when we do these workshops on site, we learn things that we didn't think of before. So we, the plethora of ideas that we have have come um, from all the reading that we've done and from all the workshops that we've done, getting input from other educators. So as a parent of a child with TS, we want to sincerely thank you for attending our webinar this evening. We believe that an informed, caring educator can make all the difference for a student dealing with challenging issues. Please stay with us after the question and answer period to complete the evaluation. Your feedback will help us greatly. Participants, I'd like to reach out to you and ask that you encourage others to access our archived Module 1 webinar from last week, as well as this evening's webinar, which will be archived shortly. 
If you participate in the entire webinar, professional development hours and continuing education units are available. Again, we need you to complete the evaluation for us. Parents and educators can log on to our website or contact the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome to find an on-site workshop at one of the local colleges or to arrange an on-site workshop in New Jersey. Kelly? Uh, I think I'm going to jump in here just before Mark. we begin the Q&A. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind the attendees that we do not have a medical professional participating in tonight's webinar, so we will not be addressing medical questions. We are going to begin questions that will begin with questions that were posted to the webinar chat board during the presentation, and we'll answer as many as we can tonight. However, if we don't get to your question tonight, or if you think of something that you'd like to ask, by all means, post it to the webinar site over the next seven days, and our presenters will answer it for you. So unless uh, we have anything else, I'm going to begin with some questions. And um, I'm going to start with a parent who has a son with TS, ADHD, and OCD. And he has what the parent has described as fits uh, or rage attacks. Uh, he'll hit or kick anyone involved, and yesterday he was suspended from school for kicking the teacher. We're looking for some strategies on how a school can handle this situation. Ladies? I've experienced children uh, in the classroom situation with those kinds of, of issues. Um, it's really tough to deal with. What I find is uh, the most helpful thing is to try to intercede before it gets to that level. If you can find ways to help the kids um, kind of come down and, and recognize that they're getting stressed, that's very helpful. Um, the resources that, that are being shown right now, Rage the Explosive Child by Ross Green is a fantastic resource for just that specific issue. I would also suggest that um, we give this child a set of, as best you can, a set of, um, if we can build in strategies so that when they get a sense that this is going to occur, that there is um, a easy access path to a calm place or someone that's available to help and try and intercede and maybe work things through um, verbally if it's not the um, explosive rage that I mentioned earlier. Um, that is kind of uh, a bit of a mystery in, in that the episodes seem to be kind of unprovoked and just so spontaneous that we really cannot always find what the uh, trigger point is. So that if, if that's not the issue and we can begin to have the child understand what's causing or creating some of the anxiety and the, and the frustration and tension and then begin to build in strategies to deal with some of that. Um, I have a, a child of my own with, with rage issues and so I, I know how very difficult it is to deal with and also with the school population to um, acknowledge because there's there are things that are definitely beyond control at that point, but, you know, the child has to be responsible for behavior in the school building to some degree, so um, I, I would suggest that the explosive child and also consulting with your, your physician um, to make sure that there aren't any other issues that they can support you with. Okay, thank you. Another question. I am a parent of three sons with Tourette and a, as well as a special education teacher. Students without learning disabilities find it difficult to process and accept the seemingly unfair accommodations made for students who need organizational and behavioral allowances. Uh, this parent's looking for suggestions to communicate differences in individual student needs that doesn't embarrass the student needing the help. In my school, we often say fair isn't always equal. And, and I try to let each student know that I'm going to try to make sure that uh, their needs are met and what may meet their needs may not seem fair to others, but, it, you know, each child is an individual. Cheryl? I, I would agree and concur on your statement. Um, the first thing I was told by a pediatrician is fair is not the same for all children, 
clear is what each child needs. And um, if that's a philosophy in a classroom and um, accommodations or um, different uh, strategies to accommodate learning styles for each child are there and demonstrated to all children in a classroom, that it, it builds um, a better understanding that you know you may need some extended time for this. Um, that's frequently a huge issue at the high school level. As I said some kids are getting extra time to take a test, and others, um, you know, are, are held to the to tighter constraints, um, and that we have to make some accommodations for every child to support them so that they can achieve to the best of their ability. Um, Oftentimes what I do also is um, I, I use physical issues that kids are familiar with. Like I might compare it to diabetes. I might say, you know, a diabetic might need snacks during the day. Now you might not get snacks during the day because you don't have diabetes, but a child with diabetes needs that. And, and so if a child has ADD or OCD or TF or something else, they might need different accommodations, just like the diabetic might, or just like uh, a child with allergies might need certain accommodations within a classroom, like don't bring pets in or, or something like that. So if you compare it sometimes to uh, physical issues that children are real familiar with, it sometimes makes it easier for them to understand the ones that aren't so clearly seen. Okay. We have two questions that are actually very similar, so I'm going to kind of read them both, okay. but I think they, they touch on the same things. Um, one relates to how to handle a classroom situa situation where a child's tick, for example, vocalizing or clapping, might be disrupting the learning process for the other kids. And, and a similar question from a high school uh, teacher who has a student uh, with OCD and this student feels compelled to speak over and interrupt the class and interject all sorts of comments. And so this, this teacher also is looking for some strategies on that. So in both cases, the child with the student with TS is, is uh, the, the, the tics are really interfering and in, in making it hard for the teacher to conduct business in the classroom and not disrupt the other students. For the child that's having a disruptive tick, we know that we can't discontinue the tick and make it stop um, as you will, but there might be ways that we could minimize the impact of it. Um, if, if the loud sound is banging a desk or um, clapping hands, we might be able to suggest that in place of that, the child could um, do something against a, a soft cushion, or um, sometimes um, children will agree to like a tick substitution of sorts. Um, it doesn't always work, but it's something that the parents and the child can tr experiment with. So maybe they use a squishy ball instead, try something along that line. Um, in terms of the high school student that's speaking and um, being disruptive by interrupting or speaking over. Um, I would consider that that may also be an impulsive kind of response to things, um, as well as the um, OCD part of it. And some of that could be reflected in um, or, or addressed in um, some social skills dialogue and a discussion about appropriate ways to have conversational exchange and waiting until the other person has finished speaking um, and address it more from an impulsive um, perspective than, than maybe the OCD. Um, Janine, you had a suggestion? Yeah, good, good suggestion, Cheryl. Um, I think that it's important to validate the child's need to do this. So right. the way I generally do it, and I have many students throughout the years who have had the ADD issues, so they have the impulse control issues. And, and I notice a lot of them do the tapping on the desk or the tapping of their foot. And what I'll do is very quietly go to them and say, I understand that you have that urge to tap. I'm not saying you can't tap. Hello? Hello, does somebody call 4584? No, uh, no, we did not. Oh, well, this is on my caller ID. 
Um, we're in the middle of a webinar, so there's nobody here that would have been dialing out. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Bye. or something like that. The vocal tics are a tough one, and sometimes all it takes is allowing a student to leave the classroom. One of the things I've worked out with the secretaries in my uh, building are if a child's having a real issue, and it could be, uh, maybe it could be vocal tics, maybe it could be an anger issue coming up, any of the issues that would be interfering with that child or any other child in the classroom being able to to achieve or being able to focus or, or attend a task or, or complete work, what I'll do is I'll act like I forgot to send something to the office in the morning. And I have a note on an index card that's tucked in one of those interdepartmental mail envelopes. And I'll say, oh, no, I forgot to drop this off in the office this morning. You know, Billy or Sam or Jane or whatever the name is. Uh, can you run this down to the main office for me? And that will get the child out of the classroom environment just long enough Sometimes by them changing what they're right. seeing, their environment, that may be enough to do the trick. So they'll go down to the office. The secretaries will open it up. They'll see the note that says needed to get out of the room. They'll sign it, put it back in the envelope, and say, okay, give this to Ms. Hallie, and the child will bring it back to me. Now, I find that real effective with eighth graders because sometimes, as I said, just getting out and moving or just changing environments uh -huh. sometimes is enough to bring that. Um, you know, under control. And I understand it means time out of the classroom, which is a problem, but if the child and the other children aren't able to gain anything from that classroom situation at the time, it might not be such a bad trade-off. I call that the empty errand. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, what accommodations may help the student cope with the challenges in the classroom other than educating school staff on the conditions? Educating other peers. You I want me to repeat that? Yeah, if you would. Okay. What accommodations may help the student cope with challenges in the classroom other than educating the school staff on the condition? So what can you do besides, you, do, you know, educating the faculty? Are there any accommodations that may help the student cope? Mm -hmm. I think peer training is peer training, real helpful yeah, because yeah. as peers understand it, um, from a neurological perspective, you know, at whatever level they're on, um, as peers understand it, they're more patient and more tolerant, and it takes some of the stress and anxiety off of the TS students. They absolutely need to understand um, what's happening and the reason for it. And I would say from fourth grade on, I was a visitor in a classroom, and I went and did a science lesson about neurology and just, you know, the basics that I, that I could get from the literature and talk about how some of these things work and why sometimes these things are a little bit more difficult for some people and others. And the kids are fascinated to know that, um, you know, it's nothing that this child is doing intentionally. They're not meaning to be disruptive, distracting, or um, impulsive that it's all connected to brain chemistry and just like some of you are wearing glasses because you can't see, then these children are, are demonstrating behavior because there are things that aren't working right neural, in the neurochemistry. Okay. Um, I think that's a good suggestion though, is just to try and work with informing the classroom children. All right. I have a, a question here uh, that actually I think is an interesting idea. Does enlarging the text help a child with eye ticks when he needs to read? That's a great suggestion. Yes. Not only would it help a child with eye ticks, it will help any child with any of those fine visual motor, you know, the visual motor tracking kind of things or, or like a dyslexic issue where maybe words are jumping around. I find enlarging text helps. In fact, I'll be honest with you, when I put my notes together for tonight's webinar, I use a really large font so that I wouldn't make mistakes as I was reading. I, I agree. I think that's a great idea. Okay. And then uh, just to add one more thing, um, sometimes blocking visual fields will also help. So that rather than have one full page of text, maybe only um, have something, whether it's an index card or a dark colored piece of paper that can be um, placed over the main sheet of text that will only expose 
several sentences or a paragraph at a time and then um, show the child how to move that so that um, the text that they need to read is exposed and the rest is blocked out. Because every time there's an eye tick and you come back to, to the midpoint to continue reading, you're struggling to find the line of text that you are on. So sometimes blocking some of the visual skills can help. I even tell my students, it's OK. They're eighth graders. I tell them, it's OK to read with your finger. I know that back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, students were smacked on the knuckles with a ruler for reading with their finger. But if there's truly a learning issue you know, going on where they're struggling, sometimes that is a, a tool that they can use to help feed their reading. Um, and, and it helps them not lose their place. So not only increasing the font, but I would say actually reading with the finger, you know, is, is not a problem at all. OK, great. Um, what, what can I do to stop a student from chewing on the eraser end of his pencil? I'm not sure that we can stop a student from doing that. If it's like an obsessive thing or a nervous kind of thing, I guess you could possibly offer gum chewing. I know that's not allowed in my, in my building, um, but that might be something you could work out with an administrator to sort of replace that right. urge to chew. It's like an oral fixation, and that's why they're sticking the eraser in there. Right. I would say just have the kid use their own pencil, and if they want to chew on it, they chew on it, uh, as long as I don't have to touch it. I don't really care. <laughs> I think if you can substitute something more appropriate to chew on, um, that might be a suggestion. There are, and if they consult with a speech therapist, um, there are things called chewy sticks. And it looks like a, it's like a, the best thing I can liken it to is like a rubber sort of um, pretzel rod sort of thing. I mean, that. They're different colors and shapes and sizes, but it would look something like that. And chewy sticks are sometimes um, helpful. It, it gives kids that have the need for that sensory input um, something that they can use that's more appropriate than chewing on pencils and you know cutting their mouths on wood or leather, <laughs> metal pieces from the eraser part. So if you talk to a speech therapist, they can probably direct you to um, the right catalogs to find those. They're, they're inexpensive, and it's, it's more appropriate. OK. Um, understanding that it is important to be sensitive to the student's special needs, it is also a delicate balance to know when to push and when TS is being used as an excuse for less than typical work. How do you make such a differentiation? Well, that's yours, Janine. You're in the classroom every Ooh. day. Yeah, that's a real tough one, and it really takes knowing the student. I just I, I try to always just be encouraging, and um, and not be too frustrated if they don't achieve a hundred percent every day. Because truly, I mean, how many of us are able to achieve a hundred percent every day? Some days we go to work and we're just not quite up to snuff. So I would just say I would continually be encouraging and saying, I really need you to get that done. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes if I see a kid being a slacker, I'll, I might go to them <laughs> and, and just very quietly say, hey, what's going on? Are you real tired today? You know, is, is there an issue? Are you not feeling well? Something like that. Sometimes if they feel like you're connecting with them, they, you might get more work out of them. Or I might say, hey, I'm available at lunch or after school if you need extra time to get that done. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed how fast they get work done then. I also would consider adjusting expectations if you observe an increase in the severity of the ticks. So if ticks are really out of control at any point in your school year, that's when I kind of um, monitor what my uh, expectations are and make adjustments knowing that when they subside, and we know that they wax and wane, and when things subside and calm down a little bit, here's your opportunity to step up to the plate. We've got some work to make up. And um, if you have that dialogue, particularly with kids in middle school and high school, if you have that dialogue, I can be understanding and accommodating to a, a greater degree when the ticks are really out of control. But when things settle down, you know, now is really time to, to get a lot done. OK. Um, I'm just reading this now, and uh, 
I believe it's a question. I just haven't, I need to understand it, but I, I, I think it's worth bringing forward. Um, uh, this uh, uh, question is from a woman. She says, I am a psychotherapist and the mom of an eight-year-old son with TS and ADHD. My son academically tests in the above average to superior range, and the mom is conflicted about supporting the special ed classification. So, so that's, I think, a point that might be worth addressing, and whether it's um, something that um, the decision has, you know, will allow for some accommodation, but does it make a difference if you uh, have that classification? Do we want to bring Sandy in on this? That's fine. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I think uh, th the question is very important. I think that the special ed classification certainly provides many um, supports for the child. So it provides a safety net for the child, but it should only be utilized if it's needed. Um, it was not designed to, uh, to be that a classification be given out when uh, someone was just basically diagnosed with a disorder, but rather whether there is an impact educationally. Well, it would seem so, Sandy, in this particular case, that yeah. having this classification has allowed so much more in for accommodation that he's thriving now. Absolutely. But there's this kind of sense about stigma, which I think shows up for a lot of parents. Um, I, I think the stigma is much less now than it used to be back in, the, say, ages 20 years ago. Um, and I think you will find more and more parents are seeking out the classification and the services that are provided. I would certainly... Um, you know, urge that the classification be continued if it's being successful. I think it's very important. It helps the child's self-esteem. I also think it's important that the child understand what this means and that this does not reflect on uh, them as an individual, but it's simply a learning style. So I hope that helps. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you. I have a question about erasing. If a student has OCD along with TS and erases to perfection, what can be done to help? Word processors and computers. <laughs> that would be my first suggestion. Um, the font is always consistent. And if the child finds a font on the computer that is satisfactory in terms of the OCD, um, every time that O strikes on the computer, it's going to look exactly the same. And um, <clears throat> it does make for a much smoother and quicker uh, homework and school process. I would also say making some accommodations in the amount of homework that's required and writing that's required. If the child can respond to questions in alternate ways, um, sometimes doing it on a tape recorder or um, demonstrating mastery of, of the subject through a different kind of project that's not necessarily writing. Um, you know, can you, can you draw a picture or, or demonstrate your, your knowledge of the history topic in a different way than, than writing a report? Um, find that acceptable and, and uh, allow the child to do something maybe orally. And if computers aren't available in the classroom, keep in mind there's other tools like the AlphaSmart that we mentioned earlier in the webinar. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, what are some strategies for helping a student who has TS and ADHD and is frequently distracted while reading independently? Now, this kind of falls a little bit into the category that, of the previous question and maybe um, you know, reading by finger might be the solution here. I would agree. That, that's a, certainly a good accommodation that will be very helpful in that situation. Um, also encouraging the student, you know, um, when you find that they've sustained their attention on the task for a little bit, and I know it's labor intensive, but the end product is, is what you're looking for. When, uh, 
when you find them staying on the task for a little bit, make sure you reinforce that. Hey, I saw that you really you stayed on task for a really long time, or wow, you really read a lot of pages before you took a little mental break. That kind of stuff might help. So encouraging to help shape that behavior so that ultimately they'll be able to attend more. And again, uh, there's um, on your uh, web page is uh, some suggestions for uh, resources for ADD. This was an independent reading task, Marty? Uh, yes. I love beanbag chairs. <laughs> Because it, if you give the child sometimes a, a change of a place to sit, and it's not a desk at or it's not a chair at a desk, which oftentimes is not a real comfortable seating place anyway, um, if you give them a change of a place to sit that's different, it's a, a big beanbag chair or um, some other kind of uh, chair or place to sit. Sometimes just that comfort of of being in a, a better uh, seated position for the reading. Or those real big squishy pillows that they have. Yeah. Now, if yeah. they could even put that on their seat and then yeah. sit on that so that they experience more comfort. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just that small change will allow the child to stay on task that much longer. And also making sure that if you want them to do that independent reading, that there isn't a lot around them that's distracting. If, if there's construction going on in the playground, and they're seated next to the window, well, shoot, I'd want to watch the uh, backhoe instead of a reading book, too. So um, trying to, to minimize the uh, distractions that are in the room during that kind of an activity might help. OK. And I think um, that's going to conclude our uh, Q&A for tonight. Thank you, ladies. Yes, thank you all for joining our webinar on an in-service for educators module tool. We will, our next webinar is on October 29th, and it will be given by Dr. Lori Rockmore. There is an exit survey which should show on your screen as you exit. Please fill out the evaluation on the exit survey. The chat board will be open tomorrow and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site soon. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Janine and Cheryl, for your excellent presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. Good night. Good night.